Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in today to the David Piedela podcast. Today, I have a very special guest by the name of Zach Evans. He is a very successful person in the music industry and a very dear friend of mine. And I think everyone can learn a lot from his experiences and how he got to where he's at. Uh, Zach talks about his piano lessons that he sells online. We'll get more into that. But later on, if you are interested in getting some of these piano lessons for yourself, be sure to use the links below as it helps out the channel and uh, helps me get more great content for you guys. So here is my conversation with Zach Evans. Well, Zach, thanks so much for being on today. Um, so before we get started into the, the meat of this, can you tell the audience uh, who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. My name is Zach Evans. Um, basically, I make a living selling online piano courses. So I have a YouTube channel, and then I have a free piano course, and then that leads to one of the premium courses that you can buy. Um, that's basically how I make a living. Okay, solid. Uh, so let's get in, into the, the meat of this. Um, so what made you want to pursue online piano lessons and, and creating an income this way as opposed to any other uh any other path you could take in music? Yeah, so I always kind of knew that I wanted to kind of do my own thing, set my own schedule, not have a boss, that kind of thing. Um, and it kind of fell into place in college. I would upload a video almost every week to YouTube of me just doing cover songs on piano. And, you know, back then the plan was like either A, get famous, or B, get enough YouTube subscribers that I would make, you know, enough money off the YouTube ads that I could make a living that way. But, after like three or four years of doing that, I started to actually like crunch the numbers and I'm like, man, on YouTube, like, I mean, unless you're getting like millions of views per video, like you're, there's no way you're going to make a living off the ads themselves. Yeah. Um, so I started looking up other ways to like make money. Cause at the time, you know, after doing it for three, four years, like my channel was getting a couple thousand views a day, just like on old videos. Cause I had like a hundred of them on, on YouTube. Oh, solid. Okay. So yeah, when I was in Nashville, um, I went to this entrepreneurship meetup group and every week they would have like a different topic they would, they would talk on. And they started talking about membership sites. And I was like, Whoa, membership site makes perfect sense where people pay like a monthly membership because for piano lessons, people are already used to that. It's already like, okay, every week I go to my teacher and I pay, or every month mm -hmm. I go to my teacher and I pay for the, for the lesson. Yeah. So I was like, this makes sense. Plus the fact, okay. If in the first month, let's say you get 10 people to sign up at, let's say, you know, 20 bucks a month, now you're making 200 the first month. But then the next month, if you add 10 more people, you're making an extra 200 on top of the original 200 of the people still paying that month. And then, you know, the next month you can make even more. So you can basically like stack your income as opposed to like hustling for money every single month. Right. And then one thing that kind of does is it frees you up to just keep adding people without taking the time to give them individual piano lessons. Exactly, exactly. And people ask me nowadays, like, why I don't teach, like, in-person lessons anymore. And it really is to the point where, like, okay, like, let's say, even if I could make, like, 150 bucks for, like, an in-person lesson, if I spent that same time making another video and putting it on YouTube, you know, I'm not going to make 150 bucks instantly, but over the course of, like, that video being up for four to six months, I'll probably make over 150 bucks off of it. And then plus the rest of my life, I could make, you know, money off that video, essentially. Right. Yeah. The, um, the term for that, for people who don't know, is evergreen. Evergreen content is stuff that just continually makes money. Um, like Zach's videos, he's got content out there that's always going to be making money as long as it's up. As long as YouTube doesn't take it down or he doesn't get canceled or something. <laughs> yeah. And that's why I love YouTube. Like, people are really trying to get me on TikTok. Like, my friends are like, yo, you got to start a TikTok. And... I mean, don't get me wrong, like, you can definitely make a lot of money off TikTok if you're, like, you know, really good at doing it. Mm -hmm. But what sucks about TikTok or Instagram or Facebook or any of these other platforms is, like, you put a post on Instagram or TikTok, it gets views for the first two days, and then nobody ever sees it again because, like, it's down in your feed. So it's like, man, oh, yeah. if you spend a lot of time making a really, really good video and put a lot of effort into it, it's like, I want that video to be around forever. I want to put it on YouTube and 10 years later, people are still watching that video and it's still bringing in views. That's a really good point. Um, what do you think about TikTok and Facebook for marketing and then having like your YouTube be the end goal for them? So market on TikTok or Facebook with short videos and then bring them to YouTube. Do you think that's something that could work out? 
I, I think it can, but it's just a matter of how much how much time you have and how much energy you have in the day. So like, okay. like I think it's better to just dominate one platform 100% and like really put your energy into there. And then if you have a little bit of extra time and you're like, okay, yeah, let me... Like for example, my YouTube videos, I'll post them on Facebook. Mm-hmm. You know, but I don't I don't re-edit my YouTube videos for Facebook. So for example, on my on my Facebook page, like in the middle of the video, it's like subscribe to my channel, which makes no sense because it's <laughs> a Facebook page. Right. But it's just not worth the effort of me like redoing the video for Facebook because Facebook is kind of just extra for me. You know what I mean? Okay. And, and same thing with, you know, kind of TikTok. So people can probably figure out too like what you're talking about when you say subscribe to my channel right like they typically know it's youtube right or am i just yeah i think people get it like oh yeah he just uploaded the same one but they're like you know as long as the content's good you know it doesn't really matter that much yeah that's a good point so dominate one channel one one method and that's that's the secret to your success is dominating that one platform yeah, because there's there's just so much that goes into to each platform and figuring out how it works and how the algorithm works and and like even on YouTube like um I, or I think on any platform I think quality is super important and figuring out what quality means to your audience and how to get and not just quality like oh like the video is good quality like it's not grainy but quality as in are you giving people exactly what they want are you giving people not not just the content they want, but also the are you saying it in a way that's motivating and that keeps people watching your videos? You know okay. what I mean? Yeah. So that's and like a- for example, TikTok, I tried uh because I do like covers like collaborations with singers. Okay. And I'll just put them on like my Instagram reels and I post them to TikTok and they're getting like no views. And then, <laughs> you know, it, and it makes sense because I'm looking at like, other TikTok videos and it's not just somebody singing standing there. It's always like cut, 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 cut. Someone's over here. Whoa, they're over there. What? Yeah. It's always like, you know, it's always like very fast moving. Yeah. And I can see that on TikTok. So it's like, if I was going to learn TikTok, it would take a long time to really get the flow of like how to create videos in that kind of choppy sequence that work and like testing a bunch of different things and seeing what like resonates with people. It was like YouTube. I know it works for YouTube. I've done it on so many videos. I know what my audience wants. So it's just a matter of like making more videos. Sweet. That that is the perfect segue into the ne- into my next question. Uh, how did you grow your audience? Because it's gotten pretty massive over the the last few years, and and you're killing it. So uh, where did you start, and how did you get it to where it's at? Yeah, the beginning on YouTube was just a grind. I mean, it was literally just every week do a video. Um, I mean, it probably took a good like two or three years before any of my videos hit like even over like twenty thousand views or something like that. Wow. Okay. Um. And then just slowly but surely, you know, the subscribers started started gaining. And, and you learn along the way. So, like, for example, you got to, like, test different things. So, for example, my teaching videos, um, a lot – some of the first ones I did were tutorials on specific songs. So, it would be, okay. like, how to play this Justin Bieber song on piano, you know, and I would show people how to do it. And then I uploaded one that was just on, like, how, how to play arpeggios. And what I noticed is – the the ones where I did the Justin Bieber tutorials, it's like when the song's popular, it can get a lot of views, but then, you know, two weeks later, the song's not popular anymore, and then it gets no <laughs> views. Whereas right. the Arpeggio video, like, to this day, like, what, six, seven years later, whatever, it's still getting views. So then I'm like, oh, I need to focus all my attention on teaching more piano concepts and not how to play this exact song. Okay. Um So, yeah, you kind of, like, learn as you go, and then you kind of – another thing I learned was I did some videos where I wasn't actually at the piano showing them specific things, but I was more talking in front of the camera and teaching them concepts. Like, hey, here's how you should structure your practice routine, stuff like that, and this stuff just didn't hit. It just didn't get views because I'm not – you know, they're not seeing the piano, and that's what people are kind of excited to learn. Okay. Another thing I learned is, like – um to make stuff super, super easy. Like sometimes in my old videos, I thought I was making it easy enough. And then I would get comments like, hey, you're going way too fast. And then I was like, okay, I need to make this like dirt simple. Cause I have to realize a lot of the people watching my videos are just complete. Like probably most of the people are like complete beginners. But yeah. you know, I wouldn't know that until I make a video, see the comments, oh, I'm doing this wrong. Let me, let me turn a little bit, you know? Yeah. 
So you did read the comments um, to, to kind of guide you. Do you still read the comments? Yeah, typically uh, I don't spend too much time reading the comments because you can get sucked down a rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> but typically if I upload a new video, the first like three to five days, I read all the comments that I respond to all of them. Wow. Um, basically, my thought is because like I get so many comments now that it would just it's not an efficient use of my time to go respond to all of them. Yeah. It would take like forever. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, but in my opinion, like a new video, the first people that are commenting, those are like your ride or die fans. You know, those are people the second the video comes out, they're subscribed, they're watching it, they're commenting. So like those are the people I want to prioritize because it's like, yo, if you're giving me this much um, you know, this much effort of your own, like I want to give you that same kind of energy back. And also those people are probably gonna buy the most and they're they're gonna share it mm. with their friends and they're gonna tell people, yo, you gotta check out this Zach Evans guy, the piano superhuman channel. Like, you know, those are the people who are gonna be spreading the word. So Yeah, interesting. Okay. That I'm learning so much here. Um for those of you who don't know, I started this podcast uh, to help you guys learn about music business and whatnot. But a selfish reason is that if I get to have cool people on, I get free business advice. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's smart. Uh, That's super smart. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> so, uh, how long did it take you from the moment you started monetizing on YouTube? How long did it take you to go from that point to full time in music? Ooh, let's see. I'm not exactly sure when I actually started monetizing my YouTube channel, but it was probably like two or three years in. Okay. So probably another like three, three and a half years. Okay. So then what did that yeah. process look like uh, from your first dollar to going full time? How did you, uh, what, what did you put in place as far as both habits and for building blocks of your business? Yeah. So originally it was, you know, my first dollar was just off the YouTube ads that, you know, YouTube pays out, mm -hmm. uh, for per view kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, my original idea was, oh, I'll just get more and more subscribers, keep doing videos and grow the channel and then make money off that. So like I did that for like two or three years more where I just keep uploading videos and they're mostly videos of me playing piano. Okay. And, you know, after like three years of doing that, I went from making like a dollar a day to making like, or a dollar, a dollar a month or something like that to making like 30 bucks a month. And that's when I was like, yo, this obviously isn't working. Like, honestly, <laughs> I spent way too much time doing that strategy where that obviously wasn't working. Yeah. Um, but it kind of worked out because then I was getting, you know, a thousand or two thousand views a day on my channel, which then motivated me like, hey, if I can get like one percent of these people to like buy something, you know, like that could actually make like real money. You know, I could like increase the amount I'm making per month. So I wrote an ebook. Um and was that I, the one you wrote in like, college? Yeah, the okay. supercharge your piano practice. Yeah. yeah, wow. Yeah, you sold it for like, how much did you sell it for? It was like twenty five bucks, but with the discount, it was like fifteen. Okay, <laughs> solid. <laughs> yeah, so I started selling that, and like uh, originally when I lost launched it, I sold like I think it was like eight copies or something. So I made like you know two hundred bucks in college. Yeah. It's not too bad. Yeah, I was kind of excited, but. In the grand scheme of things, the amount of time I put into it was like, dang, I put in this much work and made 200 bucks, like <laughs> definitely not worth the time effort. But like you learn every time. So then I learned, oh, because the, the book was about practice strategies and like basically how to be more uh, effective with your practice time. Okay. But you learned like, even though that's really important, it's not what people are looking for. Like beginners on piano don't even know that that exists. They don't know that they need efficient practice strategies. They're just like, yo, how do you play Mary had a little lamb? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, so then, so you learn like, okay, I need something that people are actually looking for. So then the next ebook I uh, made was lightning fast piano scales, because there's a lot of people who have piano teachers. There are a lot of people that know that they have to learn scales, but they struggle with their scale. So I'm like, this is an actual problem people have and an ebook that actually addresses their problem. Okay. So, so once I did that, um, that one I put on Amazon and, and I was, I marketed it a lot better, but it was only like five bucks. I sold it for four ninety nine. but that after I launched that, it was making me like a hundred bucks a month consistently. Wow. Okay. Is that still making so, you money? Yeah. Still makes between a hundred and 200 bucks every month. Evergreen income. Yeah. Evergreen income, baby. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, that's that's when I and then after that, actually, I wrote that in Nashville, I think. But then after that was when I went to that entrepreneurship meetup group. They started talking about membership sites. Okay, and I was like, okay, this is definitely going to be like. I remember coming home super jacked after that, the entrepreneurship meetup where I was just like. I was like, yo, this is going to work. Like, I'm going to make a ton of money off this if I can <laughs> figure it out, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I started doing the membership site thing. And it took me, like, a long time. It took me, like, nine months to finish it um, because I had to figure out how to set up a website. I had to figure out how to take credit card payments. Mm-hmm. I had to figure out how to set up, like, oh, like, you don't have access to this membership level because you haven't paid for it. Oh, and then yeah. I also created like a couple different courses. So I have like a technique mastery course, a play by ear course, stuff like that. Okay. And I had to figure out like, oh, if someone has access to this course, but not this course, you know, they get access to this page, but not this page. Mm-hmm. Super confusing. Um, but, but in the end, I had like an actual solid product to sell. Okay. Sweet. And yeah, so it took me about nine months to build and then about, Probably a year after that, something like that, before I was making, I remember I wanted to make double what I was making in my job, and that's when I hit that point, and I was like, okay, now I can quit my job and do this full time. Okay. So can we go back to the ebook for a second? Yeah, for sure. Uh, the second ebook, <clears throat> excuse me, the second ebook you did, what did you do differently for marketing? Like, how did, how did that one make you money as opposed to the first one? Um, so the first one... I basically just put it out there and I was like, hey guys, this is a cool book. Here's what it covers. The second one, I actually like learned how to do like a sales page and learned how to do um, how to write emails that you can, that actually sell to people. So for example, um, one thing is like you want to cover benefits and not features, right? Okay. So a feature would be like, hey, this book has like... Um, three exercises that'll help your scales, right? That's like mm-hmm. a that that's like a, a a feature, but the benefit is like, oh, this is going to get your scales smooth and confident. So you feel smooth and confident when you play. Mm, okay. Or this is going to uh increase your finger strength so that um you, you can eliminate that sloppy choppy playing you have and turn it into turn it into beautiful confident tone. You know, this is what the pros have. So like there's ways of wording things that get people actually like to buy stuff as opposed to just saying like, Hey, like here's some things that this product has, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So one more time for the audience, what was the name of that second ebook in case they want to learn better piano chops for scales and stuff? Lightning fast (laughs) piano playing. Yeah. Lightning fast piano scales, lightning fast piano scales. That's the the, the book name. Yep. Perfect. Um, maybe I'll put a link in the show notes so people can check that out. Dope. And that's on Amazon. Yep, it's on Amazon. I think you can get it on my website too, either one. Okay, solid. All right, so then you went to this entrepreneur meeting um, and you got the website all set up. Can you tell us what that entrepreneur meeting was about? Um, I've, I've heard about them, but I don't know, like, I don't know too much about them. Yeah, it was, uh, I just went to meetup.com because um, I was like new to Nashville. I was like, oh, I should like meet friends and stuff. It I sounds like, oh, like a place to meet girls. <laughs> <laughs> i mean you could meet some girl entrepreneurs you know in the entrepreneurship meetup group maybe there you go <laughs> um but yeah basically there's this there's this guy that organized it and every week you'd go and like either him or somebody else would talk about some subject like sometimes it's like oh affiliate marketing or they'd have one on like seo or they'd have one on you know something else and okay. you know one week it was just membership sites and it just like resonated with me Okay, solid. So then that took you nine months to, to put in place. Um, I got a couple questions here. One, what was the, the set of habits you had to put in place to make that happen? Like nine months is it's not a short amount of time for building something. You get discouraged, obviously. So what, what habits did you put in place? Yeah, so definitely, I mean, one thing, waking up early. I, used, I would wake up at 6 a.m. Um, and then I would drive to my job because I worked in this office and they had better internet because my internet at home was like really bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then from six to nine, I would work on the piano site. Mm-hmm. And it was actually funny because like my boss would come in every day and see me there super early. So he was probably like, dang, Zach's a really hard worker. <laughs> really, I was like working on my piano site up until nine, you know? You're just stealing their internet and uh, yeah, he thinks you're doing great work for them. 
Yeah, yeah. But uh, but it also kind of put me in the mindset of like work mode, you know. Okay. Yeah. Um, but definitely, yeah. Waking up early helped, and then I work a lot of most days after work. I'd stay like a couple hours. Okay. And then weekends, I'd get excited because I'd have the whole day, you know, to actually like do stuff. Yeah. Um, another big thing is I would create these big charts before I started anything. Okay. And I would try to predict exactly every single step that I was ha- going to have to do to finish the course mm. and how long it was going to take. So I'd say like, wow. oh, like, so for example, step one would be like brainstorm what the course, what's all going to be in the course. And then step two would be like create the outline with all the lessons. And then, you know, step three would be like solidify the outline and like edit it. So it's like correct. Okay. And then, you know, and then step four would be like video one. And then, you know, sub under video one would be like plan video, script video, record video, edit video. Wow. And then okay. video two, plan, script, record, edit, like for all the videos. And then all the pages would be like set up page, put video on the page, create text, create PDF cheat sheet, you know, for like everything. Yeah. Um, and then I'd estimate the time. So like, I'd be like, okay, record video, probably hour and a half, right? Edit the video, maybe like three hours, you know, and that way you know exactly how long it's going to take to create a course. So it might be like, okay, it's going to take like 54 hours to create this course. Okay. And then you say, okay, well, how, how long do do I have to work per week? So it's like, okay, maybe like four hours per day, like two hours before work, two hours after work. Um, and then maybe like eight hours on weekends. So you just do the math and it's like, okay, I could do a course in like three weeks or whatever the math adds up to. Yeah. Yeah. And then just put it on your calendar. Um, and that way, when you're going through, like, you have a very specific thing where you wake up and you just look at your list and you're like, okay, next thing is video number five. I have to edit. Okay. Boom. Let's go. You know? Yeah. And there's, because a lot of procrastination is just like feeling overwhelmed and like, oh, shoot, I have so much to do. But when it's just, that's just the next one step on the thing. All right. That's what I'm doing. You know? Tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up at 5.30 and make a bunch of lists. Like, that is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Do it. Do so, it. So, uh, the next thing, over that nine-month period, did you ever get discouraged about, like, did you ever get imposter syndrome, that little voice in your head that says you're not good enough, that you can't do this? Did you ever get that? And if you did, what did you do to get over it? 100%. Um, there's definitely, especially, like, you know, four or five months in, it's like, dang, I'm like burning like i'm like burning myself out yeah creating these courses and i'm like what if i create these and then nobody buys them <laughs> you know what i mean like what if you do all this work and just nobody wants it you know and it's like that's definitely scary yeah um and then on top of that that's actually the reason i created so many courses off the bat instead of just one course is because i started off creating the technique course and then like i was like halfway through that and then I got the imposter syndrome. I was like, oh, I don't think anybody's going to care about learning technique. Like people want to be able to play like flashy stuff. So then I started creating the Project Captivate course, which is my course that teaches like uh, cool left hand patterns and flashy runs and fills and stuff like that. <laughs> okay. And then midway through that, I'm like, actually, I don't think people really care about this. They just want to play their favorite songs off the radio. So then I started doing the play by ear course and I got halfway through that and I was like, Man, it's way too hard to teach anybody to play by ear if they don't know music theory. So I, I kind of <laughs> have to create a music theory course that gets bundled in with the play by ear course. Yeah. So then by the end of the day, I had like four different courses. And then I was halfway through each one. So I was like, well, shit, I might as well finish these. I'm already halfway through. Yeah. <laughs> so then, I mean, that's part of the reason it took me like nine months to finish them. Um, because I had like four separate courses and then like mm. all the work that goes into the, the marketing of all those courses and stuff. Um. So, yeah, like, but, dude, there was definitely some days I was like, man, am I just doing, is this, like, retarded? Am I just, like, doing something <laughs> that makes no sense, you know? Yeah, like, that yeah. I'm just going to do all this work and then make no money, like, you know? Yeah. So, what did you do to get past that imposter syndrome? I mean, to be honest with you, a lot of it was, I was, like, super excited at the beginning, and then I got, you know, a month or two in, and it was kind of like, well, I kind of got to finish it now because I yeah. put so much work in. You know, it, it's almost like getting excited at the at the beginning front loads your work. And then you have so much work and you're like, <laughs> I have to finish it. Otherwise, it's like I wasted all that time. Yeah. Like, that's definitely part of the, part of what happens. Um, also, 
I would read a lot of or um, listen to a lot of audiobooks and podcasts. Okay. And that's just like, and what I realized, because like a lot of the business books and like self-help books and success books and motivation books, they all kind of say the same thing after you read like four or five of them, you know, like Think and Grow Rich and like mm-hmm. all those those type of books or even like like the Tim Ferriss podcast or like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, And for a while, like a couple of years ago, I like stopped listening because I was like, oh, they're just saying the same thing over and over. But then my motivation went like way down and I realized even though they're saying the same things over and over, it like it's not about learning something. It's about like like getting yourself in the mindset of constantly just wanting to push and constantly. And then when you get that imposter syndrome, then you're listening to a podcast and you hear something about the imposter syndrome that they're talking about. You know, you hear some story about some guy who like started from an even tougher position you did. And now he's a millionaire, you know? So like, so you hear that and you're like, Oh man, like I could do this. You know what I mean? So that definitely helps too. Cool. Cool. You know, I, I used to listen to a lot more podcasts than I do now. And now I'm focused on like a law podcast and I, I focus on certain aspects of different news around the world. And I need to get back to, to podcasts like the Tim Ferriss podcast, like something that reinforces like, Hey, you can actually do this if you just do it, you know? Yeah. No, the same thing happened to me. Like for a while I was getting stuck on like, like the Joe Rogan podcast, you know, which is cool and like interesting, but like at the end of the day is like, it's not really going to help you business wise. You know? Yeah. I've been listening to a lot of Rogan lately and it's like, yeah, it's it's fun to listen to, but just like you said, it's not helping me at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So now that you've uh, you've built this business, you're crushing it. Um, do you first first of all, do you think it was worth it? All that time put in. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, long term, I think it was for sure worth it. Anything you regret about the process? Um. Yeah, probably just not yeah i guess at the beginning i i spent too much time just pounding my head against the wall doing the same thing instead of like switching like like when i was uploading the youtube videos in college and i was just doing mm-hmm. a video a week for like three or four years like i should have noticed sooner like hey like let's try something else which is like kind of a dangerous thing to say for like you know people are listening to this and and want to start a business because i think most people probably have the opposite problem where they try something for like a week and they're like, Oh, it's not working. And then they try something else. And then, you know, all over the place. But like, yeah, for me, I guess, um, cause my dad's a gym teacher. Okay. So he would always like, when I was younger, he would, he hated people who would complain about anything because like, <laughs> you know, as a gym teacher, it's like you literally, everybody's always whining about, Oh, I don't want to go run. I don't want to do push ups. Yeah. So like if his kids would complain, he wasn't like, he would cut that out right away. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like for me, I was, I got a little bit into the, like, it's a good habit to have because it's like discipline. But then I would also get into the mindset of like, oh, I just got to keep pounding up more videos, more videos, more videos instead of kind of looking at, okay, I've been doing this. Like if you've been doing something for like six months and have no traction, it, it's like, okay, that's enough time to say like, let's try something else and see what happens. Okay. And do you think let's say someone does do something for like six months and they're not getting any traction. Do you think they should look into marketing things and, and keep their product that they have, whether it be like a digital course or um, some kind of branding or whatever? Like, do you think they should look at different marketing first or try something new completely? Or is it situational? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely situational. I would say on the whole, uh, in my opinion, most people don't focus nearly enough on the sales and the marketing side. Okay. I think cop at least for online business, copywriting is the most important skill you can have and copywriting meaning um copywriting means basically writing in a way that sells. So knowing how to write like for example using storytelling, um knowing how to use like like scarcity and other um there's a lot of hardwired triggers we have in our brain. Uh, that make us want to buy, know how to tap into people's emotions and how to phrase things in a way that make people like respect you and treat you as an authority. Like there's certain ways of writing that no matter how good your product is, like nobody knows how good it is. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, like, like I've bought products before that are like bad products, but like they had really good marketing. So I bought it, you know, (laughs) obviously. uh, And the thing is like, 
if you have like the sales and marketing is about how to get people in the door and then you have to have a good product for like long-term success you know what i mean yeah. so if your problem is nobody's buying your course in the first place you don't know if your product is good or not because nobody's buying it you know so like you have to focus way more on sales and marketing and get people to buy your product and then once you have a lot of people buying your product then you can see oh if everybody's canceling their membership if everybody's <laughs> asking for refunds then it's like oh my product sucks i gotta work with my product but but if you don't have the sales and marketing down you don't even know if your product's good so that, like yeah. i would focus typically i think most people myself included um when i was first starting out don't focus enough on sales and marketing like i spend an equal amount of time typically if i create a new course doing the marketing for the course as i do creating the course wow wow that's huge yeah, because the marketing, what goes into it is like, it's not just like, okay, let's say you have a product, right? You want to sell it. So you put a page, you put whatever course, whatever, uh, learn how to make money off the music industry, right? Mm -hmm. And then you put a little button that says buy now. Obviously, that's not going to sell anything because right. it's just a title yeah. and a thing, right? So yeah. it's like, okay, now you what you want to do is you want to go to all your competitors and see what kind of language you're using on their pages when they're selling their stuff. And not copy it directly, because obviously you're probably going to have different product than theirs, but see how they're framing stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and you can kind of like take little things that that people use and and use it for your own thing. For, so, for example, um, one guy that I've studied a lot, he does a thing where he breaks it down into how much it would cost per day, right? So if you have something that's 30 bucks a month, you can say in your copy somewhere, 30 bucks a month, that's literally $1 a day. That's like less than the price of chicken nuggets at McDonald's. Like how much is your dream of making money in the music industry worth to you? Is it worth more than a dollar a day? You know, like you might have that somewhere in the copy. Yeah. But that's like something you you get from studying other people's success, basically. Yeah, yeah. So like the marketing is like, oh, you study a bunch of stuff, then you create your your page. You might do a video. You know, obviously a video is going to take longer to like edit and stuff like that. And then you create the marketing emails, um, which is a whole, whole nother topic. But um, yeah, Dude, there's this, a lot of that goes into it. This whole episode is just pure gold right now. Thank you so much for being my first guest. This is amazing. Um, I've got a few more questions yeah, here sure. and then I'll, I, I know you're a busy guy, so I'll let you, let you free soon. Um, so you talked about the music industry. I know it's just like an example, but that's a, a good segue into this question. Um, what are your thoughts on the music industry today? Like, uh, everyone can put out music. You don't need a big record label anymore, but also record labels used to be selective and only put out quote unquote good music. Um, what are your thoughts on that and, and the music industry in, in general and how people monetize it? Yeah, I, I'm very kind of libertarian about it where to me, it's like, um, if your goal, if someone's goal is just, oh, I want to make music that's creatively, um, that creatively I enjoy. And it's like, and I just like it because like it fills my muse or whatever, you know, that's fine. Like you can create that music, but don't be surprised if it doesn't necessarily sell, you know what I mean? Right. And, and the truth is like, like. People like music, and if you want music that sells, it's probably going to be more mainstream, poppy sounding. It's probably not going to have super deep lyrics. It's going to be kind of surface level lyrics, <laughs> and that's just the way it is. Like yeah. you can't like force force millions of people to like your music because you think it's good, you know. Yeah. And and don't get me wrong, like it's like if if you know someone wants to make music that's like, oh yeah, this is deep and this is uh has like cool chord changes in it or whatever reason it's cool you know that's great but but you can't like force other people to buy it so i i kind of just look at it from a practical perspective of like it is what it is you know if you want to make money in the music industry either figure out how to make money or don't you know or just get some other kind of job that you enjoy too and do music as a hobby you know okay yeah so what, what's uh what's your opinion on record labels um do you have one i don't know yeah i to be honest with you i don't know like that much about them just because i'm not i'm in the music industry you know to some extent from mm -hmm. youtube and stuff like that but i'm not in the industry from that standpoint of really knowing a ton about record labels gotcha but that being said i have a lot of friends in the industry uh basically most people that get signed to record labels don't make any money like 
huh. they work on a principle of like I think I think the stat was nine out of ten. I'm pretty sure that I heard that that get signed to a record label, lose money, and you've probably never heard of them before. <laughs> and then the one artist that becomes Beyonce, right, makes yeah. like millions and millions of dollars and ends up basically paying for the failures of all the other, the artists and bands. Wow. Um, but, and, you know, that being said, I've also heard a lot of horror stories about record labels where they'll sign an artist and then the artist will try to put out songs, but they can't like put out songs for three years because... The record label, you know, has the exclusive contract to anything that they write. And now these but the record label's not releasing any songs for them. So it's like they're kind <laughs> of like trapped in this in this record label for no reason. Yeah. So you gotta be careful for sure if you if you sign a contract. Um I I mean, yeah, it's, it's like and, and at the same time I see it from the record label's point of view too. Because sometimes there's good record labels and they're just like, yo, your music isn't selling. You know, because the record label spends a lot of money recording your album, you know, getting you in the studio, paying the engineer, the producer, doing the marketing. And it's like, if yours isn't selling, they might lose a hundred, hundred grand on your record because yeah. they're trying to promote it and they're spending money on, on a, a good recording engineer. So like, imagine yourself in their shoes. If you spend a hundred thousand dollars on somebody and it's not resonating with an audience and you're not making your money back, of course, you're not, you know, going to continue to market that artist. It, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, I think it's really important for people to hear too. Um, that that was a really good point. Yeah, like if 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 you were in the record label's shoes, making the investment, how would you feel if the band failed? Then, <laughs> yeah, it's like, and, and that's the thing too is nowadays, like you really don't need a record label. Like, there's a lot of people doing it independently, mm -hmm. um, and and I think it's probably easier, um, like to blow up and become like world famous. At some point, you're probably going to need a label. Like, a couple people have done it. Like, I think Macklemore did it. And I think Chance the Rapper, like, didn't have... A, but not both of them have labels. You know, because it's just it's just easier when you have this powerhouse behind you that's has all the connections, has all the money. But if you just want to make, you know, 70 grand a year doing music, and you can set it up yourself. You know, you can grow your own audience. You can reach out to, to try to get booked or try to get gigs and stuff like that. You yeah. know, you could like have a manager who takes 15% or whatever. Uh, and you could, it's probably easier to do it yourself. Interesting. Well, I hope uh, the audience listens to that and lets us know what they think because I don't know. I'm, I'm always curious to see what people think about that. All right. So, one mm -hmm. last question before we go um, What advice would you give to people starting out in the music industry today, whether they want to be in a band or own a studio or start an online membership thing, selling piano classes that, well, let's not compete with them with you, but uh, maybe some online <laughs> guitar lessons. <laughs> what, what advice would you give to people uh, just starting out, don't know where to go for the first step and are just looking for a sense of direction? Yeah, I think you just got to jump into it, pick something and just work super hard. And then you'll, you just figure out your way. Like, I think most people when they get in, start off as one thing and then end up as something else. You know, like like Post Malone started out as a heavy metal singer and now he's like a rapper guy. Wait, you know what, what I mean? Really? Like, yeah, Post Malone used to do like heavy metal or it was either rock or heavy metal, but Well, I need to find this. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. And like, you know, some people come in, you know, like like Kanye came in as a producer and then he became a rapper. You know, like mm -hmm. a lot of people and like even me, you know, like originally I was like, I'm gonna be a piano player. And then I kind of fell into the whole YouTube piano teaching niche. And I was like, oh, I actually enjoy this. Like, I enjoy teaching. You know, it's fun. And, like, it, it's I make a lot more money than I would playing. You <laughs> yeah, know, and it yeah. gives me the lifestyle I want, essentially. And I'm, I love it. You know, so, like, I think that a lot of people, they're waiting for, like, the perfect path. But it, it literally doesn't exist. You know, if you're, like, a lawyer or a doctor or something, it's like, yep, you go to school. You know, then you go to grad school. And then you go to your clinicals or whatever. And then, like, you just get a job. It's like there's a very, like, laid out path. Whereas music is just, like, it's, like, random. It's like, oh, yeah, I know this guy because we did a writing session together. And then he was like, yo, you want to join my band? And then you, like, played keyboard in his band. But his band sucked. But then the drummer in his band, like, was getting gigs. And then randomly they needed a keyboard player. So then you started getting gigs with his band. And, like, that's how it works. And you end up in some random situation but it's just like putting yourself out there like constantly that's cool 
Well, thank you so much for doing this. Um, where can people find out more about Zach Evans and uh, your piano lessons? Yeah, if you just type in Piano Superhuman on YouTube, it'll all pop up. Perfect. Uh, and then what's your website in case people want to buy some piano courses? Uh, bestpianotips.com. Okay, I will visit because <laughs> I suck at awesome. piano. All right, well, thanks, dude. <laughs> I will uh, catch you next time. And everyone who is listening, stay tuned for the next episode. Thank you so much for tuning in today, and I will see you then. Thanks.